see, how does this look? Are we going? Are we going to be live? Maybe. Yes. No. Maybe. Uh-oh. All right. Let me close this down and restart it and see if we're up and going. Hmm. Ah, we are alive! Someone was able to be here! Good! I, I, I'm not liking the way Facebook has been working, so I don't know if it's saving, but welcome and good evening. Uh, we are going to be looking on at more of Ephesians 4. We're going to be starting at verse 17 tonight. And, uh, and that will be where we go. Um, I'm trying to think of anything profound before we start on in. Remember, we are moving into the effect of faith, of, of what our life in Christ looks like, how it spills out. And note, this doesn't make us alive in Christ, but when we see what life in Christ is like, we know what is attacking us. We know where Satan would try to throw us off of Christ. So, um, are there any questions before we dive in? Oh, Dr. Dunlap probably would be pleased that I could read the comments. All right, awesome. So I'm going to just start diving on in and get on in because I want to. I think I want to get a go on. All right. So <clears throat> Hebrew, uh, not Hebrew, Ephesians four seventeen. Therefore, I say this and bear witness in the Lord that you no longer wander around as the nations wander in the empty talk of their thoughts, being darkened in understanding, being strangers to the life of God through the ignorance which is in them through the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they are handed over to vice, so as to strive for every impurity in constant desire. All right. This is one of the big themes. And it really is something that I think is a great way of describing what sin does. Sin... Oh, I can spell. <laughs> Sin hardens your heart. This is the the oh, good job with the lighting brown. <laughs> well, you can see that I erased the sin. Oh goodness! Hardens your heart. There we go. Um. That phrase has weight. Um, when Jesus is asked, why does Moses allow a certificate of divorce? He says, it's not that way from the beginning, but because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allows it. And we, we don't get some of the depth of what's going on by the hardness of heart. Um, it's a reference to idolatry. Um, one of the, the classic themes of the Old Testament is that if you worship idols, you become like the idols. You become not a living being, but you become dead. You become a, a thing of rock, a thing of, of metal, a thing of wood. You have eyes, but you do not, do not see. You have ears, but you do not hear. You have a heart, but it doesn't do anything. It is hard and dead. And so the contrast here is between what we see in the, the wilder world, the wider world, the, the pagan world, where everyone runs off after all their various gods, after all their various desires. Uh, one of the things that, that paganism really did is you had a, a multitude of deities, each with their own field, their own topic. So you had Athena as the goddess of wisdom. You had a Aphrodite or Venus as the goddess of love. You had, you had a, oh, I can't 
think of all the others. But I mean, they, they all had their own little field. So, so if you were really drawn to this passion, you had the god or goddess that you could worship. And the, the point that Paul makes here is that's death. That's being dead. That's being, how, how does he put this? Empty talk. Ignorant. Darkened. Hardened heart. Handed over to vice. Um, not to put too fine a point on it, but what we see around us so often in the world is people handed over to their vices. People who are handed over to vice so as to strive for every impurity and constant desire. I, I, I don't think I need to connect the dots. But it's not just the obvious ones. It's the same thing as uh, the workaholic who's driven by greed or pride. It, it's, it's gluttony. It, it's, it's desire for fame, desire for respect. All these things that drive people and not in a good way. Not to good things. Not, not where they take a reasoned and understanding approach to say, how do I best love my neighbor? But rather, I'm going to do this because this says something about me and I'm going to get it done. And it's a terrible thing. It, it is, it's being hounded by Satan. It's, it's wandering around that peripatetic, but not in understanding, not in the light of Christ, not seeing all things through Christ, but in darkness. And driven simply by, by passion. Driven in a, a constant desire. Um, that word constant desire is meant to be sort of horrific. Um, desire in and of itself is bad. I mean, it's nice to be hungry. But imagine if even though you ate, you were never satisfied. That's the idea. It's an unquenchable, un unsatiable, insatiable desire. One that doesn't stop and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much success you have, you want more. And this is how Paul describes life, if you want to call it that, apart from Christ. Where nothing is finished, nothing is completed, nothing is good enough. And, and We've all seen where that can go, where that can drive people. And so Paul says, no, when, when we're talking about this, that, that's not who you are in Christ. That should not be the focus and drive. Welcome home, Gene, and, and all that. So let's carry on with verse, verse 20. Oh, I didn't print off all that I would. Oh, yes, I did. Never mind. There was a page break in. All right, verse 20 through 24. But you did not learn these, these things, from Christ. If indeed you heard him and have been catechized in him, just as truth in, is in him, put off your former way of life, the old man who is corrupted according to the deceitful lust. But be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man which God created in righteousness and the truth of holiness. Now, this is profound. This is wonderful. We get that contrast between the old man and the new man, the, the sinful flesh and who we are in Christ. And put, put off, put away, get rid of um, your, your former life. Your, your, your former way, the old man, who is corrupted according to, to deceitful lusts, according to deceitful desires. One of my favorite Cheryl Crow songs is Why Him? And, and the, the whole point of the song is it, it's a, a plea to her, her, her boyfriend, who's a jerk and doesn't like her, to why to me? To tell me that that I'm all the stuff that you'll need, just don't leave. And, and it, it's it's a heart wrenchingly beautiful song because it so often depicts the 
the, the desperation, the deceit of the passions. Because the guy's no good, and he's no good for it, but the, the, the drives are promising something that they'll never deliver. And this is the way of sin. Chase after things that never deliver, that never satisfy, that, that don't fulfill. And rather, put away that off of that and be renewed, made new again in the spirit of your mind. Now, um, if we say mind, we, we often think of our, our head. But, but one something very important is the word for mind. It's noose. It's one of the neat things about watching uh, Greeks, uh, Greeks, uh, British soccer. When they say they want to describe that a, a manager knows what he's got, they say he's got nous. Because the, the Greek came in somehow into the, the British slang. Alright, so what we have, the word for repentance is metanoia, a, a change of mind. So when Paul says to, to <clears throat> let, me, let me translate this, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, this is talking about repentance. This is, this is repentance language. This is God will renew your mind. It's not just that your mind gets changed, that you repent once and that's it, but the spirit will constantly renew, will refresh, will, will keep you in repentance, in that change of mind. And how does this happen? You put on, put on what? The new man, the, 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 the kind, the renewed, the fresh. Um, there are two words in Greek for new. There, there's neo, which means like the first or the, the, the start. And then there's kainon, which, which means refreshing, like if, if, I, if I were to walk out tomorrow and the sun were shining, I'd say, ah, oh, what a bright new day. It's, it's not that it's the first day ever, but there's that refresh, that, that, that satisfying, that, that delightful. That's what we are in Christ. Renewed men. Fresh men. Okay, that sounds bad. Refreshed people. There we go. And how does this happen? Well, put on the new man, which God created in righteousness and the truth holiness. How are you made new? In Christ's righteousness. The way we are made new is in Christ. The way we are made new is by the Spirit giving us Jesus and all that Jesus has done and all of his holiness. That, that God himself pulls us out of darkness and gives us new life. And it's different. If you have a renewed, a refreshed life, it's going to look different. It should have some different focuses and goals than the old stuff that you had to toss out. As Christians, we see differently. Because we see all things through Christ. And we understand that we receive all things through Christ. And that our blessings come from God. That our daily bread is given by Him. And that what we do have is not just for our own glory, but for the service of our neighbor and love. And the tension, the problem of our own lives is that our own flesh wars against that. Whereas... I know who I am in Christ and that I am secure in Him. I'm assailed by fears. We all are. We all have our own fears that we worry about. We all have our, our, our misplaced loves that tempt us to, to run along in blind, stupid passion. We all are tempted to put our trust in different places. And yes, I did just play off the first commandment of this meaning that you should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. 
and the cure to that is to have Christ placed upon you again. To have the Spirit come and refresh your mind by, by holding Christ Jesus and Him crucified before your eyes. To turn your eyes away from the thing that is lousy and corrupt over there and putting it straight on Christ again. And so that is the, the, the movement, the idea, the, 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 the take there. And this is something that goes on constantly. I like to uh, liken the, the Christian life to a giant game of whack-a-mole, where various temptations pop up at various points, and we get called upon to beat them down. But often while we're beaten down one thing, another temptation pops up. And sometimes something that we think we've had long licked flares its ugly head again. You're in Christ. That's the reality of who you are, not, not your temptations. Fight against them, don't run after them, and live in Christ's mercy. And when sometimes your fight against them does not go as it ought, the Spirit will renew you by forgiveness, by giving you Christ's righteousness. So, I'm going to pause there for a moment and see if there are any questions. I, uh, I, okay. I, I'm going to give a, a complaint, a lament. So often, there will be pastors who complain that that I, and other folks like me, don't preach enough sanctification. You don't teach enough about holy living, about what you need to do. And then I listen to them. And they really talk about their hobby horses, about what they want you to do, and all that. And, and I, I compare it with what Paul's doing here. Because Paul is instructing about what the Christian life looks like. But it's always centered in Christ, and who Christ is. And it always goes back to Christ. And it happens because it's in Christ. Sometimes even pastors want to run after the passions of their flesh and think that if I can harp on this hardy horse, that'll show how good I am. No, no. You have your own trials and temptations. Everyone does. The Holy Spirit knows how to deal with it. Look at Christ. So, all right. So I, I, I like how broad and applicable what Paul does is here. He, he doesn't actually, and by, by, by putting off these former passions, I mean, don't do this and make sure you don't cheat on your, I, I, it's just, you know what it is. You know what temptations fight you. Yeah, fight against those. So let's move on to the, the next segment. We'll look at verses 25 and following. Therefore, Putting off the lie. Uh, sometimes this gets translated as putting off falsehood, but it's literally the pseudos. It's, it's the lie. It, it's, it's the opposite of truth. Therefore, putting off the lie, let each one of us speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of each other. I want to pause there very quickly. Um, One of the, the things that, that the world does is it undercuts our relation to each other. Or it, it centers our relation in agreement. You're part of my tribe if you vote the way I do. Or if you share my race. Paul says this. That, that we should speak to each other in truth, that we should put away lying because we are members of one another. The idea of being a member is such a, a profound sense of unity and connection. And Gene, I, I hate to use this analogy on you, but your body members don't lie. There's a communication. Uh, Paul also will, will say, when one part of the body hurts, the, the whole body hurts. 
Um, and yes, the, the point here does have the idea of those in the body of Christ. Because again, note that idea of body. We are, we are all members of Christ. And he is really dealing with a lot of, of how we live together. But I, I think it can be expanded even just beyond just the church because, because um, we are all fellow creatures of God. And the person who is not a member of the church now ought to be. They ought to be. And if it were not for the lie that they were chasing after, and if they had the truth spoken to them, Christ Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, perhaps they would be fully made members of our body again, the body of Christ. But think how interconnected your body is. If one part of your body hurts or is injured, that has a dramatic impact upon the entire body. And if one part of your body is enjoying something, if I have a very nice sip of my, my, my drink, and I enjoy that, it's not just, oh, my tongue enjoyed it, but my feet are utterly disconnected. No, there, there's that connection. The, the truth, the reality spreads forth through. And you can't, if your body does not uh, do that, <laughs> uh, if your body doesn't communicate accurate, that's a really bad problem. I mean, that, that, that's catastrophically bad. And so this is, yeah, we, 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 we're dealing with truth, not lies. And, and so much of the world is following the these beautiful lies. All right, 26. Well, 26 and 27. Uh, be angry, be wrathful, but do not sin. Uh, let the sun not go down upon your anger, nor give any place to the devil. Again, this is, this is beautiful practical advice. Be angry, but do not sin. Uh, at the risk of telling tales of myself, one of the things I tend to fear is anger. I work hard to control my anger. Oh, pastor, you don't get angry. I work hard to control my anger. So I tend to be very distrustful of, of times when I'm angry. And Paul makes a note here. Be angry, because there are times you will be angry. If uh, anger is a like, there are times your body will be in pain. All right? Don't, don't let, deal with that pain, but don't let it drive you into stupidity. And then Paul gives a very simple practical advice. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Uh, the, the adage I like from this is uh, Dr. Scott Bruzik, who used to be over at Moments and now is at St. John's Wheaton, uh, has this beautiful pithy phrase. Righteous anger has the shelf life of manna. You might have righteous anger, but if it's going to be righteous anger dealing with Christ, it's not going to drive you to sin, and it's not going to stick around with you forever. It's not going to constantly paralyze you. So yeah, you let anger come to so you can recognize something as, as wrong, but you can't dwell on it. You can't invite it in to be your your family member because it'll corrupt. It'll lead you away from where you ought to go. As the scripture says elsewhere, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. So yeah, no. If you get angry, that happens. But don't let it push you to where you shouldn't go and don't hold on to it. How much of what we see for discourse in the world is really people holding on to their anger and using their anger that they hold on to to justify all sorts of stupidity and sin. Paul's warning against that. Be honest. You're no longer angry. You're you're grudging. You're 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 no longer looking to find justice. You're looking to have an excuse to get back at someone. Yeah. Don't 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 live not by lies. 
All right. Why? Because if you live in anger, you give place to Satan. Seriously. Satan can do a whole lot, a heap of bad with you when you're running around in your wrath. All right. Now 28. The one who steals. The klepto. That, that, that literally is the, the Greek there. The, the one who steals, let him no longer steal, but rather labor. Working with his hands something good, something worthy, something, something useful, something agatha, actually, um, so that he might have something to give to the one who needs. Part of the reason we work is not just to care for ourselves. We work so that we're able to care for others. Uh, this is why I'm a bad libertarian. I'm like, yeah, no, we actually should pay taxes. But, but, but this is one of the reasons why we take anything in is so that we are prepared to give to anyone or everyone as we see fit, as their needs become revealed to us. If you're, the, the Christian life is not one of taking from your neighbor, but one of giving to your neighbor. We take, we receive from God as he gives us our talents, our opportunities, the ability to labor. Your labor is a gift from God. The ability to work is a gift from God. So use that gift, not just for your own benefit, but for the benefit of your neighbor. All right? Oh, great. Let not any corrupt words flow from your mouth. Uh, corrupt words flowing. This this has um, that word for corrupt. Um, think of disgusting bathroom stuff. All right. Your mouth should not be a toilet or what goes into the toilet. All right. Don't let and. and and by this, he doesn't mean dirty words, as we think of dirty words. Oh, he said a dirty word. That's not the primary point. The, the point is things that do not feed, that do not build up, do not increase, but are waste, are, are wretched, are foul. Whether they sound nice or pleasant, um, that's all corrupting. It's all breaking stuff down. So don't let any of those words come out of your mouth. But if you say anything, let it be something good for the building up of what is needed, that it may give grace to the hearers. If you had a mom who said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything, playing off of Paul. But more importantly, this, this is one of my favorite parts of the older translation of the, of the catechism that I know. The, uh, <clears throat> the Eighth Commandment, what does this mean that we do not speak falsehood? We do not bear false testimony. That we put the best construction on everything. That's plain off of this language here. That, that when you speak, your words can either help improve the house, can make it look nicer, or you can spe spread crap on it. You can either make the garden look nice or you can TP the trees. Which are you going to do? Don't do the ones that make a mess. Rather, when you speak, let your words be of service to your neighbor. Let it help them out. Again, Paul doesn't have to give a list of these are things not to say. You know what? You know what you're doing if you're saying your words to tear someone down? Don't do that. Build them up. All right? Why? You're giving grace to the hearers. You give good gifts from God to other people. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of salvation. All bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and blasphemy, let these be removed from you along with all wickedness. And be kind to one another, good-hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. As God has graced you. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? 
when you move away from forgiveness, when your, your words are grousing and clamor and blasphemy and complaining and, and cursing and, and looking down on a person rather than seeking to give them Christ. Because the Holy Spirit's job, a uh, foreshadow for Sunday, is to deal with the words about Jesus, is to give Jesus. And so when you say no, this person should never have anything more to do with Jesus or me, they can go, <clears throat> you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit delights in proclaiming Christ and him crucified. You're stopping the Spirit from doing what the Spirit would do. So, watch what's going on. What is seeking to keep you from preaching Christ? Yes, you preach. From speaking Christ and his love to your neighbor. Whatever it is, get rid of it. Because it's for your lips are for Jesus. Sticks and stones and words hurt. Um, the reason we have that old rhyme of sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Because that's said by the parent who wants you to get up and tough it out. Because there are times that you do need to get up and tough it out. And there are times you need to learn to ignore the words of the stupid. I, I, just, there, are, there are plenty of words that aren't worth hearing that you can safely let pass in one ear and go right out the other. And uh, some of that is learning that. Do you ever stay away from people that continue to hurt you? That is a profound question, and I'm going to give a hard answer. There are people who hurt me that I don't interact with. And you know why? It's not because they're so bad. It's my heart, my wrath, my frailty, my weakness. I have friends, I'll even call them friends, that I am no longer strong enough to bear with. That, that just with the impact of what has gone on, that I have a really hard time being a loving person when I interact with them where where the pain of the interaction prevents me from showing charity and love to them. And maybe someday, again, who knows, I will be able to bear those better. And maybe they will grow and mature. But for right now, the way to make sure that I don't give in to anger or wrath or corrupting words in response is I need to stay away from my own good. And that's the real hurt that comes on. That I am so pushed off by what they've done that I can't be who I am in Christ around them. Um, Brown's at it. Are you ready? A Christian seeks neither to offend nor to be offended. Um, I, I, I want to look at offend and upset. Both these words, offend and upset, are words for no longer being upright. See, this is upright. Now it's off its end. Now it's up and set upward. They, they imply being knocked over. And, and 
I like to think of this in athletic terms. If you aren't balanced, if you aren't on your feet, if you're knocked over, you can't do anything. Um, first thing you have to do if you're going to swing a good golf club is you have to have your feet set. You have to have good balance. If, you, if your feet aren't balanced when you're going to take a swing at a baseball, you're going to be, which is why the, the pitchers change speed to upset your timing so that your swing is, oh, I've got to slow it down, and you lose your balance. If I know that someone is going to upset me where I lose my balance and lose my ability to love, then for their sake, I stay away from them because then I'm no longer any good to them. I'm not a blessing to them. Now, the reason why I put it this way is because it's too easy to villainize people who hurt you. And yeah, they might be villains, but then the, the problem with the, the whole villain thing is that I become the hero of my own story, and then I can almost also justify defeating the villain. No, my, my, my job is not to defeat the villain. My job is to show them love. And there are times the best way that I can love someone is to not be around them is to remove myself from their presence, especially if I end up offending them with stuff, especially if I help to make them be less of who they should be. And sometimes when they're caught, when people are caught up following the passions, their deceitful passions, as we have heard earlier, uh, the simple fact that I say something is wrong means I'm going to set them off they're in love with whatever stupid thing they're following. And, and there comes a time when the loving thing to do is to step away and not try to fix them. One of the, the, the most fearful things is the, the need sometimes to let someone hit bottom. To, to step away and let them fall. And hopefully, hopefully the fall will repent them. Hopefully the, the, the impact will be something they can survive and God can dust them up. So yeah, there, there are times where, where we, we do stay away from people that hurt us. But not because they're bad, but because we in our own frailty cannot show love. Um, I'll give an I, I will give the example of Jesus here with, with, a, with purpose of forethought. The Pharisees and the scribes are determined to hurt Jesus, and Jesus doesn't stay away from them. He continues to go to them, and he's blunt with them. Jesus is stronger than I am. That's okay. But even Jesus, there were times where he would go away and stay away from them. Uh, normally when they wanted to kill him before he was supposed to go to the cross. But, but that is one of the things where, where we know our own limitations. And we wait for growth, and it might come or it might not. Um, the other thing to remember, too, is just not everything is set today. Um, the relationship that I can't have today, that I can't be in safely today, who knows what will happen 20 years from now. Commend them to God's care. Pray for them and pray for yourself. So... That's a fun topic. But yeah, so does that work as an answer for you, Carolyn? No. There are some people I don't talk to because I know I will get into a fight. Like I said, Pastor Brown does know his own anger issues. And that, that's a me problem. And I, I think that's a much healthier way to look at things. Because I don't get to change them. But rather I get to be in the Word and let the Holy Spirit change me. I don't get to control other people. I, I don't get to live their life. I get to live mine. 
So that's where my focus should be. So, all right. Now, I, I gave the example of Jesus with, with, with intention. So, the Spirit changes them. Oh, sure, the Holy Spirit might change them all the time. The Holy Spirit works through the Word, and you're not the only one that speaks to them. And who knows how the Holy Spirit will work with them. Okay, I will give another example. So, the conversion of Paul. Paul is struck blind on the road from the, Damascus. And, and Jesus shows up and tells Ananias, all right, I'm sending Paul to you. If he's blind, you're going to heal him. And Ananias says, uh, don't you know who this guy is? He's been persecuting us. And Jesus says, yeah, he's my chosen instrument. And I'll show him what <laughs> he'll suffer for my name's sake. So yeah, yeah. Ananias is caught off guard by the idea that Paul could change, that that the word of God, that Jesus' word would impact Paul in such a way. We don't know all that. I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, one of my best friends who's a pastor was a militant atheist when he was 22 years old and a drug addict. If you had pointed him out to anyone who knew him at the age of 22 and said, this man is going to be a faithful pastor one day, they have laughed in your face. Huh? The Holy Spirit works with faith when and where he wills, not always according to the timetable that we would like. So, all right, let's start. Yeah, yeah let's do the first five verses of chapter five. Because it's an odd place because it's the same paragraph in Greek. And this paragraph really ends at, at verse 5. So let, let's, let's start 1 through 5, and that'll be where we go. Therefore, be... Okay, most places say imitators, but the word is literally mimic. Mimics of God as a beloved child. And wander around in love, just as Christ loved us, and handed himself over to be a gift offering, and a sacrificial offering to God, the most pleasing snuff. Uh, growing up, we had a little small statue of a, a little kid. He was almost like a precious moments kid. Maybe it might, might not have been precious moments, but it was sort of like that style. And he had his dad's shoes on, and they were just way too big for his feet. Because that was something I loved to do. I loved to put my dad's shoes on. I was mimicking him. That's how you learn. In fact, um, when Victor had his first uh, little, like, toy phone, he would walk around holding it up and going, Hello, this is Pastor Brown. How can I help you? Because that was how I'd answer the phone. And so that's what he did. He was mimicking. The way we learn is imitation. And... And some of what we get to do as a Christian is learning to imitate Jesus. And what does he do? He wandered around in love. When you read a gospel lesson, Jesus wanders into a situation, what does he do? He shows love. And he does two things. He shows love and he hands himself over as a gift. He gives him a sacrificial offering to God. He does good and refuses to do bad if you want to put it that way. He, he does good and suffers rather than doing bad. And, and this is the idea that we are to be instruments of good used by God for God's good pleasure. Uh, coming up in, in verse 3, but let no wickedness, let no ponaria, let, let nothing bad, nothing, nothing wicked, or unclean, or let no wickedness or uncleanliness or greed be named among you as is fitting for the holy. Yeah, don't, don't be identified by your wickedness. Don't be identified by your greed. There are few things worse than for when a people, or when a congregation especially, gets a bad reputation. It's known as, oh, they're greedy over there. Oh, they're mean over there. 
don't don't let that be. That that shouldn't be what you're known for. That that shouldn't be the the image that people get in their minds when they think of you. Because then it's really hard to proclaim Christ and Him crucified if they're like, oh great, they're not from the door, they're gonna want money. And indecency and foolish talk, morologia, great word, foolish talk, or vulgarity, these things which are not proper. These are things which are not proper. Rather, give thanks. And, and with your talk, don't talk a fool. Don't 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 be an idiot with your speech. Don't be in the gutter with your speech. Rather, be someone who gives thanks to God. Uh, no mention of sexual immorality in the Greek. All right. Um, all right, Gene, we'll go there. All right. So, that word for wickedness, but let no wickedness or uncleanliness or any greed be named among you. The word there is literally poneria, from which we get porn, like pornography. And sometimes just for fun, I'll, tra fun. I'll translate it as porn to get the idea across. But the problem is, when we think of pornography today, we tend to limit it just to sexual stuff. But really, the idea of poneria is broader in, in Greek. It's not just sexual wickedness, but it would also be violence. It would be, okay, now, now I'm thinking of the song by John Mellencamp. Oh, we're getting pop music. Uh, John Mellencamp, early album, had, this is, the song is Serious Business. This is Serious Business, Sex and Violence and Rock and Roll. It, it, it's, it's all that stuff of the bad parts of rock culture, the, the drug use, the seedy, seediness might be better, violent seediness is the idea that that comes up here. So I can, actually, yeah, but, but let, no, here, let me look at this again. But seediness, but all seediness and all uncleanliness, all, yeah, so, so that's the idea. It, it's, it's a broader word than just being sexually off. Um, Sometimes we over-focus on sexual sins. They're the most spectacular. So yeah, think, think about it that way. If I say it's the seedy part of town, that doesn't mean just that there's the red lights on the corner or what have you. But there's all that other sort of vice that can go on. That's what it's talking about. That, that's the idea. Boy, Pastor, you know a lot about porn in Greek. Uh, well, yeah. Nearly professional intro. But no, it's one of those words where the, uh, the modern use of it is much more narrow than the, the ancient use of it in Greek, which, which was broader. Uh, I was listening to a podcast that was talking about the word diet, whereas we think of diet, we think mainly what you eat. But the word dietos in Greek refers not to just your, your, what you eat, but also your exercise, your sleep, your, your whole pattern of life, how you get in energy and how you expend it, which probably speaks a lot to how I need to diet better. But I say sitting down and talking. Um, all right. And let's do, uh, let's do verse 5 and finish off right there. For you know this, you've experienced this, you have the, the knowledge, the, the, the full experiential knowledge of this. The one who is poneros, who is wicked, who's seedy, or unclean, or, or greedy, who keeps wanting more and more, the one who is idolatrous. 
They shall not have the inheritance of the kingdom of Christ Jesus and God. Now, this is something that Paul does that is beautiful. He, he wraps up that, that seediness, that greediness, that uncleanliness, all into the idea of being idolatrous. Why? Well, this is why if I were numbering, this would have been the end of the previous chapter there. What do we have back in verse 17? Let me, let me get my translation out. Um, Therefore I say this in bear witness in the Lord, that you no longer wander around as the nations wander in empty talk of their thoughts, being darkened in understanding, being strangers to the life of God, through the ignorance which is in them, through the hardening of their hearts, having lost all sensitivity and are handed over to vice, so as to strive for every impurity and constant desire. You see, we've, we've gone back to that hardness of heart. Seediness hardens your heart. Uh, uncleanliness hardens your heart. Um, doing the things that make you unfit for proper society hardens your heart. Greed hardens your heart. They turn into idols that you must worship and chase after. And Paul says, keep away from those. My, my favorite ending of any book of the New Testament is 1 John, where John ends up just as he talks, he's like, little children, keep yourself from idols. It's the same image that, that all these sins become idols that demand our worship and our service. No, don't worship and serve them. Don't follow them. Don't follow those examples. You want to follow? Go, go mimic Jesus. Show love. That's who you are. And be in Christ and receive forgiveness and life because all the stupid things you chase after, they're not going to give you forgiveness. They're not going to give you acceptance. They're not going to give you... People are promised such acceptance. This, this is the thing that I, I think is so terrible for the youth today and the, the, the lust on which I have many friends, is that it was presented as we're going to be a big tent where everyone can be accepted. But that acceptance is turned into a, no, you must promote this. Even if what you are promoting, even if the flavor of the day is, is antithetical to what you want for your own interest. Not that you tolerate not that you, okay, go knock yourself out. We can all agree to get along even though you don't agree. No, now you must praise. Because that's what idolatry does. It always ends up demanding praise and never gives you what you want. Christ does give you all good things, which is a completely different thing than anything else in the world can offer. So, I think we should pause there. Um... Next time, uh, we'll get more about Paul describing the, the wickedness of life in the world, of what goes on, and the reality of the consequences of sin, what, what idolatry does. Sin has consequences. And, uh, and then we'll get the comparison to who we are in Christ, and we'll get the famous passage where the ladies, if they were here, might want to throw rocks at me, where we talk about submission. Everyone's favorite topic. It's not nearly as bad as you might think. And it's not nearly as direct as you might think. Directed at women, I should say. But we'll get there, God willing, next week. So um, I'm going to say we should wrap on up where it's been 50 minutes. And that's when the, uh, the law of diminishing returns is going to kick in for a, a lecture without people here. <laughs> there comes a point where I'll just become utterly repentant, uh, repetitive. So, all right, let's close up with prayer then. So. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light by your Son, Christ Jesus. And we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us to keep us ever attentive to his word that we might have wisdom from on high, that we might learn to avoid sin and its hardship, and that we might be restored when we do stray, and that we might live in Christ's forgiveness. Fill us with your love and all your good gifts, that we might be ready and apt to share those gifts with those that we come across. 
to be generous with them. Strengthen us in the midst of our frailties. And prepare us, defend us, keep us safe as we go about showing forth the love you would have us show. Give us nights of rest and peace and prepare us for all that you have in store for us on the morrow. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Have a... Ooh, I could have said... Yeah, yeah. Poneros is all those, those great, wonderful scenes of, of Greek and Roman drama that the artist was. Oh, the ancient world was a wild place. Just as wild as we are today. So, yeah. Paul, Paul is still applicable today. All right, let's wrap on up, and I'll be on my way. The Lord be with you. Bye. Night, everyone.